good morning for those of you on the Pacific Coast or further to the West. We're really happy to have you join us here today for this discussion of an update on the Assessment in Action Project, Academic Libraries and Student Success. And it's great to see some of you participating who are currently involved in this. And hopefully, as I believe we probably do, we also have some folks who are considering applying to participate in year two and we're excited to have you with us as well. Kara and I wanted to give you a visual since in this uh, digital age, it can be difficult a little bit to envision the people that you're hearing from. So this voice that you're hearing right now belongs to Lisa Janicki Hinchliff. Um, I work at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and I am the co-lead facilitator for the Assessment in Action program that is currently underway. And presenting with me and speaking later is Kara Malenfant, who's the Senior Strategist for Special Initiatives at ACRL, and also working very closely with those of us who are working on the AIA project. Um, we wanted to give a little bit of context to the project for those of you who may not know all of the uh, history to why we're undergoing this. It is without a doubt that higher education and education generally is being challenged to really answer questions related to accountability and what is the impact of all of our efforts. Some of this comes from the federal government, such as the 2006 Spellings Commission on Higher Education, but it also comes in the private sector via foundations, such as the Lumina Foundation or the Teagle Foundation, and also, of course, from students, parents, and employers who have asked us around these issues of affordability, public accountability, and what are students learning in college. Administrators are increasingly being asked to make difficult decisions about resource allocations, and of course, we need to uh, respond to that as well as we are trying to show the value of our academic libraries on our campuses. Higher education has responded to these calls for action in a variety of different ways. There's a number of national projects underway right now, whether it's the voluntary system of accountability for institutions to show their student learning outcomes, the National Institute for Learning Outcomes Assessment, or NILOA, the New Leadership Alliance, and then again, examples of the foundations giving grants such as the Teagle Grant or the Lumina Foundation, again, is very active in this as well. In addition, ACRL has been interested in this topic for a long time of accountability and assessment. In the 1980s, ACRL published its first book on evaluating library resources and services in academic libraries. But about four to five years ago, ACRL began to take a more intense interest and began making a commitment to help librarians demonstrate the value they bring to their colleges and universities. The general, US, I'm sorry, the general ACRL membership told us in member surveys, focus groups, and the like, that demonstrating the value of academic libraries is a top issue facing the profession. ACRL responded by creating the Value of Academic Libraries Initiative, which is the larger initiative of which the Assessment and Action Project is a part. The board held a number of different activities in order to create the Assessment in Action Project, um, I'm sorry, the Value of Academic Libraries Report, is one of those very um, pivotal pieces of our initiative. Some of you may be familiar with this report, which we issued in September 2010, over two years ago, at this, three years ago at this point. Um, this report showed that it was important to build capacity for data-driven advocacies in our libraries by enabling librarians to apply and extend the research base on the value of academic libraries so that we can align our libraries with institutional outcomes, empower libraries to carry out the value of academic libraries work locally while we create a shared understanding and knowledge in our profession of librarianship as well as contributing to higher education assessment more generally. The value of academic libraries report, which is available freely on the ACRL value website, puts value of academic libraries in an institutional context 
putting forward this quote from Sarah Pritchard as a very important key point in conceptualizing the value of academic libraries. That few libraries exist in a vacuum, accountable only to themselves. There is always a larger context for assessing library quality. What and how well does the library contribute to achieving the overall goals of the parent constituencies? This is not to deny that libraries are valuable in and of themselves, but as we seek to articulate that value, we need to do so in the context of those institutional priorities and strategies that are most salient at our particular local context. As the value report points out, that higher education institutions must demonstrate evidence that they have achieved their institutional goals, and thus the same is true for academic libraries. We need to show the evidence of our value. The ACRL Value of Academic Library Report had many, many recommendations within it. In particular was the recommendation near the bottom that says we must promote and participate in professional development and leverage our library professional associations in order to create that kind of professional development program. And that professional associations are uniquely positioned within the environment, if you will, of higher education libraries to be able to push forward this agenda. And so ACRL indeed, indeed took the mantle that was handed it in the value of academic libraries report and moved forward um, applying for an IMLS collaborative planning grant to see what that professional development would look like, as well as beginning a series of forums that we have held at every ACRL and ALA conference. Um, ACRL adopted a plan for excellence in April of 2011, which put this as one of the top three priorities for the association, as well as charging a value of academic libraries committee, which oversees and serves as a steering body for ACRL's value of academic libraries work. In October of 2011, IMLS awarded the collaborative planning grant to ACRL, and Kara is going to tell you about what we did with that grant. Thanks, Lisa. So we were awarded this um, planning grant, which leads up to assessment and action, but I think it's important to hear a little bit about what that grant was and what we did in it. So we, we really wanted to know how to shape the professional development program that we heard we needed to create, and so we sought advice from a broad range of stakeholders. We partnered with the Association for Institutional Research, the Association of Public and Land-Grant Universities, and the Council of Independent Colleges. And we had an idea to create this, these summits where we would bring people together from a wide variety of institutions to really give us some good advice on how we could create a powerful professional development program. And we held those summits in late November 2011. So we had everything lined up, all our logistics, all our invitations were out, and we were just hoping we would get that grant to help us, but we had the intention that we were one way or another going to consult really broadly with stakeholders to get some advice. So let me tell you about the summit goals. We wanted to build and strengthen collaborative relationships with higher education stakeholders around the issue of library value. We sought to identify the types and sources of data about library performance that higher education stakeholders need in order to advance their institution's missions and goals. We wanted to determine the professional competencies necessary for librarians to document and communicate the value of their academic libraries in relation to their institutional goals. And we wanted to increase awareness and understanding within the library profession and among higher education constituent groups about how academic libraries contribute to the overall goals and mission of their institutions. So those were the goals of our summits. The first summit was held over one and a half days, and we had teams from 22 different institutions with a chief academic officer, the chief uh, institutional researcher, and senior librarians. So we had all the kinds of activities you would expect, a reception, a welcome, an overview of the VAL report. We had respondents, some panelists respond to that. We had a panel of chief academic officers, and then we discussed some other information from the report. In addition to those 22 institutional teams, which were of all types, we made sure we had community colleges, liberal arts colleges, master comprehensive, 
research institutions, state funded, public, private, everything. We also had 15 representatives from higher education organizations and accreditors. So we were able to have a panel of accreditors and hear what they had to say. And then we, we learned from some of our participants and asked them to share some best practices and some case studies of how they had approached uh, demonstrating the value of their libraries. So really the goal of this first summit was that higher education participants would discuss the data campus administrators would like libraries to provide and what collaborative assistance is available through institutional research offices. Our second summit was held immediately thereafter and we asked those 22 senior librarians to stick around and spend a day with us in reflection and discussion and brainstorming. And we asked them some of the questions you see here about the main impact areas where libraries contribute, what data librarians need, what partnerships librarians could develop, and what sort of skills and strategies libraries need, librarians need to learn. So the focus for the second summit was really that librarian participants would address strategies to prepare the library community to document and communicate the library's value in advancing the mission and goals of the colleges and universities. Now, you can read more about the summits, how we organize them. You can see a participant list um, and, and a full report out in a white paper we issued, which is called Connect, Collaborate, and Communicate, a report from the value of academic library summits. And this came out in June 2010, 2012. And it, it um, reports all about sort of these, this very dynamic higher education assessment and what we learned. But I'm gonna highlight for you just a few of the themes that came out and then a few of the recommendations that led us to create the assessment and action grant. So the first theme we heard about, again, this was from presentations, discussions, small group work, collaborative work. We heard one, of, one, one broad theme was around accountability. This is driving higher education discussions. It's in the spotlight. Um, particularly in relation to concerns about the quality of higher education, its affordability, career preparedness, the value of a college degree, and higher education's contribution to workforce development. We heard that there was increased pressure to open up the accrediting process to public scrutiny, and these pressures bring into question core higher education notions of self-regulation, institutional autonomy, and peer review. And these questions about accountability really come from numerous stakeholders. Our second theme we heard throughout the course of the summits was about having a unified approach, that this unified approach to institutional assessment is essential. Institutional assessment is most effective when the efforts of various campus units are aligned toward common goals and communicate a unified message. Coming, creating this kind of a unified approach, however, does not come without its challenges. And we heard from participants really significant issues around um, having multiple campus constituents, having competing priorities, having different stakeholders who hold different perspectives, and having isolated pockets of institutional data and how that can really uh, be a challenge. The third central theme we heard was about student learning and success. These are the primary focus of higher education assessment, and this couldn't have been more clear from our accreditors. Out of anything they were interested in, it was student learning, student learning, student success. So throughout the summit, speakers and participants emphasize the importance of documenting student learning and success at all types of post-secondary institutions. In fact, a central question permeated many of the discussions. What constitutes student learning and success? How should it be defined? Rather than analyzing individual elements, skills, or competencies, it's more advantageous to see student learning outcomes as an ecosystem, and we can see the library's impact with that as multifaceted. The fourth primary theme was around having evidence-based reports of measurable impact. As issues of accountability move to the forefront, colleges and universities look to means of assessment that document student learning and success in ways that are clear, specific, and based on multiple points of data. Such efforts call for the strategic collection, analysis, and interpretation of data. And numerous sources of data from across campus must be identified and marshaled to align with and contribute to the institution's assessment activities. So these were the four primary themes we heard throughout the summits. So where, where do libraries, where do librarians fit within this picture? Libraries need to demonstrate and communicate the contributions of the library to advancing the institution's missions and goals. The external push for greater accountability in higher education is going to continue, 
institutions of higher education have deep interest in and commitment to improving the ways they meet their mission to provide high quality environments and experiences so that teaching, learning, and research activities can flourish. And libraries can really show the ways in which we contribute to those goals. We also found another place where libraries can fit in, really as connectors and integrators. This is a very unique role that libraries can play on campus. The higher education assessment movement provides a unique opportunity for library leadership. Academic librarians can serve as connectors and integrators, promoting this unified approach to assessment that's so essential. As a neutral and well-regarded place on campus, the academic library can help break down the traditional institutional silos and foster increased communication across the college or university community. Librarians can bring people together from a wide variety of constituencies for focused conversations and spark communities of action that advance institutional mission. The white paper also lists several very specific and concrete recommendations. The first <clears throat> being that we need to increase librarians' understanding of library value and impact in relation to various dimensions of student learning and success. The second recommendation is around articulating and promoting the importance of assessment competencies that are necessary for documenting and communicating library impact on student learning and success. Got that little checklist there. The third recommendation relates to professional development, which is what we had heard in the VAL report and what we were digging into more deeply in these summits. So we heard that ACRL needed to create professional development opportunities for librarians to learn how to initiate and design assessment that demonstrates the library's contributions to advancing the mission and goals of their college or university. The fourth recommendation we heard was around partnerships and collaborate that librarians need to be expand, expanding partnerships for assessment activities with other uh, higher education groups and stakeholders and that ACRL continued to need to partner with higher education groups as well. And the last recommendation was, you know, you've got some really great building blocks already. Let's make sure we really integrate the use of these resources with whatever happens next with the Value of Academic Libraries Initiative. So each of these five recommendations was followed up by very specific proposed action steps. We circulated drafts of the report back to our participants to make sure that it was complete and accurate and reflected what they had heard and what they had said during the summits. And again, you can read the whole uh, white paper as well as the Value of Academic Libraries report freely available on the ACRL website. So you can see these planning summits really gave us just what we had hoped for, a lot of very concrete, specific, useful information that we carried forward into the next phase, and Lisa will tell us about that. Great. Thanks, Kara. So the idea of an IMLS collaborative planning grant is that it helps you scope out what your next steps should be. And our next steps were very clearly developing a professional development program that responded to the parameters that were articulated during the summits. The result of which was our proposed assessment in action project. We took what we learned in November and December of uh, 2002 and turned around, and, I'm sorry, in, uh, sorry, November, December of 2011, and turned around and in February of 2012 submitted a um, national leadership demonstration grant proposal. In September of 2012, we were notified that we were awarded almost one quarter million dollars to be allocated over the course of three years for the project Assessment in Action, Academic Libraries, and Student Success. Two of our planning grant partners, the Association of Institutional Research and the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, have joined us again as collaborators in the grant proposal, and the Council of Independent Colleges is also serving on the grant advisory board. The Assessment in Action program is designed based on those five recommendations that Kara described from the participants at the summit. Um, the funding is for three years. In the third year, the IMLS grant subsidizes only part of the cost, and ACRL will have to implement a registration fee as the program transitions from a fully subsidized to a cost recovery model. In this way, it is designed to be sustainable and continue to be offered into the future past the funding of the IMLS grant. 
the assessment in action grant particularly articulated three broad goals. The first goal is to develop professional competencies of librarians to document and communicate the value of academic libraries in relation to institution goals for student learning and success. The second goal is to build and strengthen collaborative relationships with higher education stakeholders around the issue of library value. And our third goal is to contribute back to higher education assessment work by creating approaches, strategies, and practices that document the contribution of academic libraries to overall goals and missions of their institutions. You can see how these goals tie back directly to the recommendations from the summit. Ultimately, the Assessment in Action program will result in training 300 librarians along with instructional engagement and resources for additional six to 900 campus representatives on the institutional teams. The design of the professional development program and the results of the collaborative campus projects have the potential for a significant impact on the profession and on higher education generally. The facilitation team for the Assessment in Action program consists of a team of six people, and you have photos of all six of us. Deb Gilchrist and I, Lisa Hinchliffe, are the co-lead facilitators for the six-person team. Kara Malenfan is our staff lead, and the three other facilitators are Carrie Donovan, a uh, librarian at Indiana University, April Cunningham, a uh, librarian now at Palomar, and Libby Miles, who is a faculty member in the Department of English specializing in writing instruction and assessment at the University of Rhode Island. We have taken a team approach so that institutions who propose to participate in the campus, uh, part, oh, Institutions who propose to have a campus team participate in the Assessment in Action program must identify a librarian leader who will be the head um, person leading the campus team, as well as other members of the team, institutional researcher or assessment officer, and a faculty member. But interestingly, in our first year, we have discovered that people have made their teams um, appropriately larger and constructed as they need for the project that they are doing. And so this slide just lists the range of the kinds of team members that we're seeing in the first year. Our institutions in the first year come from a wide variety of areas in North America. Uh, we have two, sorry, we have three Canadian institutions participating from three different Canadian provinces. We have uh, institutions from 29 states in the United States, and we span seven time zones, uh, which has made scheduling uh, challenging from time to time. So you might be wondering how these teams were selected. These institutional teams were selected through a competitive application process, which was designed to um, identify quality team projects, but also ensure representation from a array of geographic regions and post-secondary institutions. We did note that the strongest applications were distinguished by the team composition, but even more so by their readiness. These were groups of people that had worked together and um, on their proposal and had shown that they were ready to collaborate in taking on this new project. Their goals um, were very clear for their project and they had specific topics they wanted to investigate and those topics had close alignment with institutional priorities. We also chose those that we thought had the greatest potential to contribute to the greater higher education and academic library community. We mentioned that we were looking for some great amount of diversity as well. You'll notice that all of the regional accrediting body associations in the United States are represented by at least one institution. We also have um, Canadian and medical accreditation. And then these are the range of the type of institutions that we have represented. Um, proportionately to the number of institutions in the United States are research doctoral granting institutions are overrepresented, um, so we're particularly hoping to see more liberal arts and community colleges applying in this second year that will be participating coming up soon. Um, this is a general overview of the timeline that 
people's projects have to be carried out in in order to be part of the assessment and action project. So applications, as you'll hear soon, are due in March. And um, this sort of gives you an idea that campus teams focus on planning their projects in June and July, um, acting on their project plans in August through December, uh, reflecting and analyzing their data January through February, and then March through May they'll be focusing on disseminating and sharing their results with the larger community. Um, it is, uh, of course, First, every project is proceeding on its own unique time frame relative to the particular campus institution, but this is the general overall cycle that they're working within. There's a number of characteristics of the AIA experience. The first being this notion of community of practice. It's very much structured along the idea that while there are facilitators of this experience, the experience is really owned and engaged by the librarians who are the team leaders for their campuses. So while they are, those team leaders are building their skills and knowledge, they're also building a community of practice or a learning network of other librarians who are engaging in the same work that they can rely on in order to gain advice, to share ideas, and to build their skills. The notion of a community of practice was originally theoretically developed by Etienne Wenger, who explains that, quote, communities of practice are groups of people who share a concern or a passion for something they do and learn how to do it better as they interact regularly, end quote. The facilitation team was very fortunate to have been advised by Etienne Wenger and Beverly Wenger Trainer as we developed this program. So we were, had access to amazing expertise in thinking through what it meant to scope a community of practice rather than a notion of expert presenters. The next uh, principle that we have in our design is a design of blended learning. The bulk of the support for the AIA learning community takes place virtually through asynchronous and learning environments, as well as webcasts and other online events. The library and team leaders, however, do attend in person three events. The first two are training events that are held in conjunction with the ALA Midwinter Meeting and Annual Conferences. So for example, those who were accepted into the first year of the AIA program had a essentially a one-day workshop together in Chicago during the ALA conference annual, and then they will meet again in January together in Philadelphia for another one day, um, a full day of training um, at, during the midwinter meeting. Then the third event is a dissemination event where those who participate in the first year of AIA will be presenting poster sessions of their results during the Las Vegas conference this summer. Um, for the ALA annual conference. And so the idea is that twice they meet in a learning mode and their final ultimate um, activity as AIA participants is to present their results in this poster session. Um, so a blended learning model. And we're using the Learning Times, which is Blackboard Collaborate, as well as the ALA online learning environment, which is Moodle. And we've also added uh, Adobe Connect and some other online tools as we've moved forward. Now, I've mentioned a lot that teams are working on particular projects at their institutions. Those projects are scoped as action learning projects, where the team has identified a question or a problem that is in the context of their institution, and they are working to design and implement an assessment project that will help them learn about that issue in order to make the next decision about how they will need to act on their campuses. So the focus on action learning is to lead to a deeper understanding of what happens when these assessment knowledge and skills are applied in practice. So this is a pragmatic or practice-oriented project, not just abstract learning in the way that a research methods class might be. I've already mentioned that there will be the poster session at which 
time, people will share their results. We will also be asking each institutional team to prepare a final project report, which ACRL will analyze and disseminate. Part of that report will be, you know, the details of what research question was asked, what assessment activity was undertaken, and what was learned and acted on. Another part of that will also be a reflective piece about how the approach as a team-based approach and community of practice approach was valuable or what barriers were discovered in the process. So at this point, you might be wondering, well, what kinds of things are people studying? Um, there's a huge range of what could be studied. So when you hear that they're looking at student learning and success, don't in your mind equate that to instruction programs. They're really looking at a huge variety of library factors. Now, some of them are, of course, looking at instruction. But even within instruction, you'll see there's a great variety of what's being investigated. But we also have teams looking at reference, looking at physical space, looking at discovery, whether it's the website, resource guides. We have groups looking at collections, groups looking at library personnel. They are also doing so using a great variety of tools and methods, ranging from surveys and interviews, focus groups, observation, tests, to authentic events, things like portfolios, research projects, other class assignments. We also have people looking at these things in context of test scores, GPA, degree completion, retention, and the like. So this, there's really a great variety that people are using, whether it's in the topic they're choosing or the method that they're using to ask questions about it. And on this slide, I just added four specific questions so that you could see the way these come together. Um, do students who attain information literacy or media sessions attain higher grades than students who do not? Um, here's one about special collections. How do student work with special collections affect their ability to think critically and develop intellectual curiosity? This third one is a great example of a very specific program that they're wanting to investigate. Do readmitted students who have appealed dismissal improve academic performance and persist at a higher rate due to mandatory meetings with the librarian for research assistant? And then this fourth one is such a holistic kind of look. Does our new library have an impact on student community, contribute to student enrollment, and excitement about completing skills sessions and library orientations? So you can see that these are really at a great deal of variety um, as to the kind of question, the focus, so whether student learning is at the course level, the program level, the degree level, student success might be retention, persistence, graduation. There's really, it's really an infinite number of areas of focus that a library could choose. So hopefully we've convinced some of you that you'd like to apply to participate in year two. And here's where you might be interested in some of the details. Our, the application process will be published to the ACRL Value website on J January 14th, 2014. Um, applications will be due on March 7th, 2014. And you will be notified um, April 8th, 2014, because the program will begin in mid-April with a webinar. So we move very quickly from the process of applying through acceptance into let's get started. So a few hints on the process of applying that we can tell you now. You will need a team. You will need one librarian to be the team leader, and you will need a minimum of two people from other campus units. Um, you'll need to have a discussion with them, and we very much, as I mentioned earlier, the strongest applications showed that the application was developed collaboratively. <coughs> oh, excuse me. My apologies. You'll need to write two essays. One essay will be about the goals of the project that you're undertaking. And the other goal will be from the librarian team leader about their goals as the team leader. In addition, it's necessary to secure two statements of support. The first statement of support is from the library dean or director, and that really is 
focusing on um, particularly the fact that the librarian is going to serve as the team leader. So um, looking at the library dean and director to make the statement of support. But we're also asking for a statement of support from your chief academic officer, your provost, or your campus dean, who says is able to indicate support for this project as um, aligned with institutional goals and resources as well. And so with that, um, I turn it over to you for the chat room um, for any questions or comments that you might have, either about the program generally or specifically about the process of applying. And Kara and I will take turns answering um, based on, uh, well, who has the expertise needed in order to answer your questions. Um, so, Erin, no, we don't have all the questions from the year one cohort because um, I gave you four examples, but even those four have evolved since the time that they um, put them forward. So while we have uh, the ability to use some examples, these projects are all underway right now, and so you'll see their final version at the poster session this summer. The library director can be the team leader. The important thing to realize is that the role of the team leader is a two to five hour per week commitment. And so if one is a library director, one will need to ensure that they have two to five hours per week to lead the project. Um, if, and actually that's true whether it's the library director or someone else, um, two to five hours a week is not an insignificant amount of time. So it really depends on who is appropriate to the task in your library structure. Um, at smaller libraries, there might even only be one librarian. Jenny, yes, you can definitely have a copy of the slides after this session recording is available. We have, we know who you are. So we will go ahead and post a link to the recording as well as the PDF of these slides on our website and we'll send a message around to all of you. It may take a few days to get that out, but we will for sure. We'll post it on the website. So as to who the members of your team are, I see a number of questions about that. You need to have somebody who is related to your institutional research or assessment office, depending on who's appropriate to your particular project. Um, not everyone who you would get data from has to be on the team, but there needs to be somebody from one of those two offices based on which of those projects. So um, you may have as many people on your team as you want to have. It's just a minimum number. It's not a maximum number. So, but there is only one librarian team leader and that team leader is the only person who attends the in-person sessions. I see Eric has asked a question about will ACRL release the report of the year one cohort results for those people who can't make Vegas. Yes, so Vegas, <clears throat> the ALA annual conference in Las Vegas, people will be presenting the poster sessions, but they're also going to be submitting that written report that will be very descriptive about what their projects are. And we're working on um, hopefully an online way to serve that up in a database. You can search for all the community colleges that look that reference and, and kind of sort results that way. There will also be a more reflective part, as Lisa indicated, and we have a project analyst who's going to look at all these 75 team reports, both the descriptive part and the, the reflective part, and do some analysis and, and draw out some themes about what helped projects be successful and what that might mean for how others can approach projects on the campus. So that probably will be released um, in the fall. So there's a bunch of other questions here about um, ways of scoping things. So first I want to answer that um, selected institutions will be asked to make the commitment that you will be, your team leader will be in attendance at the meetings that we hold at midwinter and annual meetings. So yes, you are required to be at those. If you cannot be at those, then that is one of the, then you would just have to decline to participate, you know, to submit a proposal. Um, so Cassandra asked about cost to participate in the program. So the cost of the program itself in the sense of the registration fee is fully subsidized in year two. And so your cost would be the cost of attending the ALA conference in the three cities that it will be held in, um, starting in Las Vegas, 
this summer and then midwinter and annual in 2015. And then any costs that you incur in the process of doing your assessment project. So if you choose to give students incentives in order to participate, then you will need to budget that. So the what is subsidized by IMLS is that you are not having to pay a registration fee in order to participate in the um, event. Um, so as far as um, a multi-campus institution, um, if you are one institution, then how you constitute your team is a decision for you as an institution, as long as it meets the parameters of having a librarian team leader, an assessment institutional researcher and a faculty member, um, or people sort of meeting those categories. And also those of you, somebody mentioned about partnering. So we are looking for, again, a proposal for an institution with a single librarian team leader. If your project were to involve people at another institution, you would describe that in the narrative, they would be on the team, but it would not be a multi-institutional application. And please hear when I'm telling you this, not in the sense that we think that that would be somehow a bad thing, but that it's not how it was designed when we proposed what we would propose to IMLS. So um, as long as you can make it fit within the, this proposal is coming from institution ABC, the librarian team leader is XYZ. We have constituted our team to meet the minimum requirement, and our team is composed perhaps additionally of additional people. That is all, that's all good. Um, there was a couple questions as well as about the boundedness of the project. So we do have some people who are doing projects that do longitudinal analysis, and in that case, they have, you, obviously in order to do longitudinal analysis in the course of one year, you would have to have historic data that you're bringing forward into this process as a way of analyzing it. So there is a need to do some sort of analysts, analysis that ends in a uh, poster within the one-year time frame. Bringing in historical data to make it longitudinal is not a problem. Um, setting up year one of what you intend to eventually be longitudinal is not a problem, but there is a one-year time frame for the engagement. Um, Cassandra, I don't know the answer to that. Um, as far as I know, no one has mentioned that there are equipped or QI projects for HLC accreditation. That doesn't mean that they are not. Can I, could I just jump in to see, I think Cassandra, you may be sending your chat question directly to Lisa. So the other participants aren't seeing it and it makes me wonder if other folks are sending questions just to one of us and not to the whole room. But if you could be sure to click on that drop down to say all participants so people can get a sense of what questions are being asked, that'd be great. Uh, let's see, examples of topics for the webinar sessions. Um, so, so, yes, we have, um, we indeed did do one on methods and particularly looking at um, making decisions about different quantitative versus qualitative methods. Um, we also have done a, a kickoff webinar, which basically is an introduction to the framing of the value of academic libraries and the assessment in action project. Um, and we also had a webinar that um, was given by an institutional researcher that was um, intended to give that perspective on how an institutional researcher looks at the issues related to student learning and assessment. Um, our webinars are complemented, of course, by our full day face-to-face -face events during ALA. So there's other things that we're doing that are topically mentioned there, like analysis tools that we'll be focusing on more, for example, in person at midwinter that were not as a separate webinar. As Lisa talks about the kinds of um, topics that we cover, I want to make sure people really clued into uh, the one element she talked about earlier, which is this community of practice. So the way we have the 75 teams working right now is that they're broken up into groups of five librarian team leaders who really work with each other regularly and support each other as people are working on their projects. So that sort of regular interaction to help um, other colleagues at institu other institutions learn and really develop that community of practice where people are learning together 
and working together is a big focus of the program. In fact, I could mention that right now we're in the middle of a series of really exciting and interactive events that we're calling our case connections, where individuals are sort of describing where they've gotten to with their project and they're sort of at a thorny issue point. And so they are actually putting together sort of a one-page description of that thorny issue. And then they are um, in this same environment of like a webinar environment where they're presenting and they're getting feedback from other people who are participating in the AIA project about ways they might uh, consider engaging that or are there other people they could talk to or other people having that same issue. We've also had a number of sessions that we've called our jam sessions, which are not structured presentations, but they're sort of focused discussions. So for example, we had one around the notion of correlation and causation. And um, what does it take to get to a claim of causation? as opposed to a claim of correlation. So we've, we've, we've actually created a, a variety of different things, kind of echoing back Kara's point about community of practice. So as people have said, what would be really useful is X. We've tried to find a way to do that. Our first year here, we have 75 institutions participating. In year two, we'll have 100 institutions participating. So it's a, this is why we have to be in this community of practice in order to have so many people engaged with this. But it's, it's really exciting because with that many people, almost always somebody else has faced the same issue or challenge. Right, so there's definitely the, <clears throat> uh, you should all have a clear in your minds the expectation that you'll be helping support other people, that they'll be counting on you to log in and you can answer their questions and work with them. So, um, so that's a big, a big piece of it. Of course, you're going to be learning new things yourself, but you'll be learning along together with others. Uh, I see one other question that I skipped over before, so if I can go back to it. Um, I think it was, um, <clears throat> let's see, uh, Jennifer who asked about, um, well, if our project is sort of underway right now, but not completely, like do we have to be doing something brand new? And I just want to say that you don't have to be doing something brand new. Um, and in fact, one of the lessons from year one is that while it's okay if the assessment is brand new, it's better if the service is not brand new. So a number of folks were trying to implement a service for the first time and assess it. And as they have run into snags in implementation, it's making assessment a little bit tricky. So it's probably um, easier to manage a project where you have something that you've been doing for a while, but you have a question about it. Now, even if you've already collected some data previously, if you're still in the mode of being open to adding another method or analyzing that data in a new way, then of course that's still something that you could propose. Um, but obviously, if you've already collected the data and analyzed it, and the only thing you really have left is the publishing of it, this project probably isn't well aligned with where you are in your learning. Um, okay, great. Thanks, Jennifer. Oh, Naimo, great question. So, um, so I, one thing I want to put back and make sure, it's investigating library value in the context of institutional priorities and institutional focus. So the key thing for buy-in, I think, is that commitment to making sure that you have framed this around something that your campus is committed to. Um, so Lisa, I can think of an example from one of our groups, and maybe you can think of others, but, but Naomi, there's one group that on their campus, they really were making a concerted effort to look at the sophomore year. They recognized that they were doing a lot for freshmen and retaining people from freshman year, having them re-enroll as sophomores, but then there was this um, drop. So the library had some particular interventions as part of the whole suite of campus interventions, and they said, well, let's look at the library piece around that sophomore year and how we're helping with that particular initiative. So really important on campus, lots of people were interested in that, and I think that was one way they were able to get buy-in. It was something everyone on campus was committed to. And Lisa, I don't know if you have other examples, real or hypothetical. 
Yeah. So I think the other thing that just comes back to the whole issue of, of this is not a good venue to get people to buy into the idea of having an information literacy program. This is a good venue to get people engaged with the assessing the impact of your information literacy program because you're going to need to have whatever you're going to assess up and running in order to actually assess it. So given the time frame we're looking at for year two, you would need to know that you are going to be able to collect data in the fall of 2014 about the thing. So if the thing isn't going to exist until January of 2015, that's not going to work because the timelines just aren't going to align. So as far as getting buy-in, remember, you're trying to get buy-in around investigating the impact of something, not buy-in around getting something to start happening. And hopefully that's a little bit uh, easier way to frame it. So um, I would look to those things that you're already doing that you um, believe are going well, but that you'd really like to understand the impact that they are having so that you can say, we should do more of this, or we need to tweak this in a certain way, or unfortunately, wow, this isn't having the impact we thought it was, we need to rethink how we're doing it. Um, you sh so, I mean, I, I think that's really, Hopefully then the faculty member or the campus has already bought into you having the thing and you're now having to say, hey, will you help us look at the impact of it? Um, given somebody is asking me about the, you know, the AQIP and the QI projects for HLC accreditation, um, if you are undergoing some sort of accreditation or something you're doing might have an impact there, I think that is a good way of getting buy-in in the sense of saying, well, what matters a lot for my institution is probably things like staying accredited, student graduation rate, uh, students getting jobs. So even, you know, because we're still asking people to work on a project with us and to take some of their time. And so if it's a project that is related to something they have to work on anyways, obviously that's a strategy that will help them see it as a good investment of their time. Oh, good. I'm glad that's helpful. Other questions or comments? We've got a few minutes remaining. Uh, so yes, actually, we have discovered that many people have had to do IRB, but we've created, and by we, I really want to give credit here to Kerry Donovan and April Cunningham, two of our facilitators, who created some wonderful documents for helping you figure out how to approach your IRB and figure out what paperwork needs to be done. We certainly found that um, many of our people do need to do IRB, but most of them were able to do so very successfully without very many challenges. So um, I don't recall anyone with sort of nightmare IRB problems so much as, of course, some of them did need to indeed get the IRB approvals. So we have some really nice materials for walking you through that so that you can ask the right questions and be able to frame this for your IRB office. And yes, that would be the Institutional Review Board or your, you, if your institution calls it something else, but anytime there's research with human subjects and students are human subjects, faculty are human subjects, pretty much any impact research we're gonna do is gonna involve humans. And different institutions um, handle this kind of activity differently. And so some places say, oh, it's not research. Other places say it's research, but it's exempt. Other places say, it's research and we have to look at the particular methods you're using. Um, so we have a huge variety, but I don't think anyone's been tripped up there. So if nothing else, that's a good reason to, uh, and again, this is also where people have given each other really good advice and shared their own experiences in ways that have been really powerful, so.
So you see Cheryl Mellenfant's email there on the left-hand side of the slide that you're seeing. Um, she's the main point of contact uh, should you have future questions, um, but we will um, look forward to seeing applications from many of you. When the call for applications is released, it will be posted at the URL that you see on the screen. And in particular, I'd point out that um, last year's call for applications is still posted there. So if you wanted to go and see the much more detailed explanation of what it took to apply last year, while there are being, we are in the process of editing that, to, particularly to make parts of it clearer, um, that would give you a good sense of the kinds of things that you'll be seeing when we post that in January. Um, I'm not sure totally what you mean by details, um, Naomi, but if you look at last year, you'll see the kind of information that we're able to provide in advance. Um, <clears throat> so the we will not be giving you the entire year's list of webinar dates or anything like that. We'll, you will have the ALA conferences, although only the librarian team leader attends those. We do have estimates, though, of the time commitment that you're looking at. So we highly recommend that you look at last year's, then look at um, what comes out in January. Keep Kara's email address, um, and we'll uh, look forward to seeing many of you applying. Kara, any final words to close us no. out? Just uh, again, I do have, we do have all your uh, contact information. So once this recording is available and once the PDF and the slides are available, I'll send a message out and let you know where you can go to, to get a look. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day.